Hi everyone! Today we're gonna talk about large language models and whether they think like us, humans. It seems like a weird question to ask, but some people have made some bold claims lately about AI in general and large language models in particular, and I think it would be a good time to try to understand what's behind those claims and whether they make sense. Now, usually in this channel, we talk about fundamentals of the world of computers and computer science, like Git or computer networks. And this time I wanted to do something a bit different. So let me know if you liked it and if you want to see more content about these topics. And let's get to it. You'll also notice that I use a presentation this time, which is not what I usually tend to do in this channel, uh, but I'm using a presentation I gave internally at the company I work. So let's get to it. Do large language models think like humans? Well, first of all, as we know, AI is everywhere and doing pretty mind-blowing things with ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dali, and everything that has been going on lately, and I'm sure you've heard about that. Yet, people seem to have made some pretty bold claims lately as well, such as why AI will save the world. These are all real titles I took from different places around the internet. So why AI will save the world, or ChatGPT will replace programmers within 10 years, or the more subtle software developers might be obsolete by 2030. The AI apocalypse is here. What will stop AI from destroying us? So as you see, kind of perhaps clickbait titles, um, anyway, bold titles or bold claims about AI and its implications. And in this talk, I don't want to talk about something that is hypothetical and make some assumptions about the future. Rather, I want to talk about a very concrete yet still bold claim that had been made lately. In a paper titled Modern Language Models Refute Chomsky's Approach to Language. So this is a bit more specific because it's about linguistics but I think it would be a very good case to consider when we talk about LLMs, large language models, and whether they could be a good model of human cognition. So the focus of this talk is going to be a claim made in a paper called Modern Language Models Refute Chomsky's Approach to Language. You might stop me at this point and say, wait, wh why is this interesting? I mean, why do we care about Chomsky's approach to language? So first of all, I think that Understanding this would provide you with a better intuition regarding large language models and how they work in general. Also, I think we could practice dissecting claims. So this is a bold claim and we might want to dissect it and think about it in a critical point of view. And linguistics is awesome. And if you haven't had the chance to learn some linguistics somewhere, I think now could be a good chance. Specifically, linguistics is interesting, but also we as humans can relate to the examples. As you will see, these are just sentences that as native speakers or speakers of English, you could relate to and have your own judgments about. Wait, linguistics? What is linguistics? So in case you don't know, linguistics is the scientific study of language. And one of the questions that it asks is how humans process language. Another question is how humans acquire language. So if we take a newborn, this is my son, Geffen, uh, on my career a few weeks ago, and Geffen was born a bit over a year ago, we expect him somewhat miraculously in a few months and years to have a lot of the knowledge that you and I have about language. So one of the questions that linguistics aims to answer is how the human brain learns a language. Cool, so just to get some intuition, let's look at one very basic example of a linguistic observation. So for instance, let's look at this sentence. Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. What did this sentence mean? I would give you a hint, it has actually at least two meanings. Um, if you want to pause the video and think about it for a sec, it might be more fun for you. So, the first meaning is that Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. That is, he used binoculars to see the man. In that case, if we consider the verb saw, then both the man and using binoculars are somewhat related to saw. And of course, I'm not using linguistic 
terms here as this is not a linguistics class. Another possible meaning is that Sherlock saw the man using binoculars, that is, the man was using binoculars, perhaps in this image, to actually look at Sherlock, and Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. So in this case, using binoculars is not part of the verbal phrase, but rather it's part of the noun phrase, the man using binoculars. So linguists can make this observation and say, in general, when we'll consider sentences, they might be ambiguous, they might have more than one meaning, and therefore, perhaps it's important to understand the hierarchy of different elements within the sentence rather than look at a sentence as a linear order of words, for example. So I have this shirt of Trust Me, I'm a Linguist, I also have another shirt saying, I'm a linguist, I love ambiguity more than most people. And if you consider this closely, you might realize that this sentence is also ambiguous. So one meaning that it has is, I'm a linguist, so I love ambiguity more than most people love ambiguity. And the other meaning is that I'm a linguist, so I love ambiguity more than I love most people. Yep, both meanings are possible. So, um, what? You studied linguistics? Don't you talk about Git internals and computer networks and stuff? So, well, yeah, I did study and I have an MA in linguistics. I also got to be a teaching assistant and a course instructor once, but we're not gonna get too deep into linguistics in this talk. I just wanted you to know my background. And in this talk, I will rely mostly on Katir 2023. So Professor Ronnie Katir from Tel Aviv University, whom I had the privilege to learn a lot from during my studies at Tel Aviv University and even be a course instructor on his behalf once when he was at MIT and I taught computational linguistics. So Katir published a note titled Why Large Language Models Are Poor Theories of Human Linguistic Cognition, a reply to P. N. Tadosi 2023. So this is not a full review, I won't describe everything. My goal is to convey the main message in a way that is accessible to people who might have not studied linguistics, for example. Sometimes I will also add my own additions and will clarify that they are my own additions. I will focus on ChatGPT, though researchers have shown the same phenomena, at least in most cases, on other LLMs. And just to be sure, I'm not saying anything against ChatGPT or other LLMs. These are amazing, powerful tools. They are awesome. I just don't think they make good models of human cognition. And we will have fun. As you'll see, linguistics is a lot of fun. All right. Let's start with a few definitions. So first, large language models or LLMs. So a large language model is an AI model, an artificial intelligence model that is trained using deep learning on lots of data. Now, this is not an introduction to AI or to LLMs, but what we should understand is that those models take a lot, a lot, a lot of data, specifically text, and trained on them to create some kind of a model. GPT is an LLM. We also have other LLMs. Prompt is an input to an AI model. And specifically when people say prompts to GPT, these are textual prompts to the large language model GPT, say GPT-4, GPT-3.5. Back to the claim. So the original claim we're trying to consider here is that large language models refute Chomsky's approach to language. So that's a bold claim. And specifically, it's bold because the claim actually is that LLMs are good theories of actual human cognition, which, as Katir noted, would be um, a bit surprising. I mean, according to this note, LLMs work like humans, at least when it comes to language. Does that even make sense? I mean, no one designed LLMs to be models of actual human cognition. So they are engineering tools. They don't try to emulate the brain. So if we can find out that they actually emulate the brain in a reliable manner, that would be pretty cool and very surprising. So looking at this from a very high level, if we get back to the linguistic question of or one of the linguistic questions of 
having a human mind take input, such as language, that in the case of Geffen, my son, this is sentences or parts of sentences that I omit or that my wife says or that anyone in his surroundings say. And after a while, he has some mental model and then we can ask him questions and get some output. So just looking at it from very far away, if LLMs are actual good models of actual human cognition, then given similar input, they should produce similar output on certain tasks. Make sense? Okay, time to experiment. So this is an experiment that Katir has performed. Let's see. So Katir says to ChatGPT, and in all cases, but those noted, Katir and also I use GPT-4. So Katir says, I'll give you a pair of sentences. Your task is to tell me which of the two is a better sentence in English. And GPT, in its polite and useful manner, says, sure, please provide the pair of sentences. So, sentence one. The person that Mary met yesterday and that John will talk to Ed about tomorrow arrived. What do you think? Native English speakers? Well, this seems like a perfectly fine sentence. Let's consider sentence number two. The person that Mary met yesterday and that John will talk to Ed about his new idea tomorrow arrived. Well, this sentence is just ungrammatical in English. And ChatGPT thinks otherwise. ChatGPT says that sentence two is actually better in English. And ChatGPT justifies this answer by saying that this sentence is clearer and more informative. That it provides additional context mentioning the new idea compared to sentence one. So indeed, it provides more context, but it is ungrammatical, whereas sentence one is perfectly grammatical in English. So you could say, all right, this is an anecdote. It's one sentence. What's the big deal? If we ask ourselves what it teaches us, we need to understand that this is a strong generalization that linguists have made about language ever since Ross's generalization in 1967. So just to get some notion of what this generalization is, if we look at the sentence, sentence one from before, the person that Mary met yesterday and that John will talk about tomorrow arrived, then, and again, I'm gonna use some linguistic terms here but not explain them entirely. So we can say that there are two parts of this whole sentence that are delimited by the word and, and each of these has a gap. So we say the person that Mary met gap yesterday and by gap this refers to the person right we could say mary met the person yesterday and the john will talk about gap tomorrow that is john will talk about the person tomorrow arrived so we can see that both conjuncts as they're called contain a gap in the second ungrammatical sentence we have the person that mary met gap yesterday and that John will talk about his new idea tomorrow arrived. So the second conjunct, the second part here, does not contain a gap. And one of Russ's generalizations from 1967 claimed that when you have such a construct, specifically in this example, two phrases that are joined by using the word and, then both of them must have a gap or neither of them. Of course, you can't have a gap in one and not in the other. This holds true in other grammatical constructs as well. For example, we can look here at the sentence, Bill washed the dishes and Fred dried them. We can pose a question on this, asking what did Bill wash and Fred dry? Now, if we consider these using a gap, you can see that actually we have here, what did Bill wash gap and Fred dry gap, because it's Bill wash the dishes and Fred dry the dishes. But if we try to have a gap in only one of them, then the result is ungrammatical and actually kind of aches my head even to try to think about it. So what did Bill wash and Fred dry the dishes? 
this is really bad, or why did Bill wash the dishes and Fred dry? Terrible sentences, right? So this is some kind of knowledge that we as speakers of English have about the language, and apparently ChatGPT does not. Again, what does it even teach us? So every English speaking child knows this generalization. And I believe that no teacher has actually gone and taught that child, look, there is the thing called a conjunct and there is something called a gap and it needs to be in both parts. People don't explicitly know that or why it's so, but every English speaking child knows that sentences like sentence two are ungrammatical, whereas sentences like sentence one are in fact perfectly valid English sentences. LLMs, like ChatGPT, don't seem to know this generalization. And why is that? Well, we can't prove that for sure, but Katsir provides a suggestion which I believe makes a lot of sense, according to which there are just too few examples of this kind in the data. So where LLMs are trained on a lot of data, they don't see many sentences with this specific construct, say with and, and they see that one of them has a gap and the other doesn't, and someone says, oh, it doesn't make sense, or in general, to see such questions posed on both parts of a conjunct, for example. At least when the learner is non-biased, it's not enough data. So Chomsky claimed a lot of things about language. One of them is that humans have an innate ability to learn languages. That is, when we are born, we are biased towards the data. And these biases make us treat the input not as just random data, but data relevant to language, and we have some biases towards it. So with those biases, we're able to learn such a generalization like Ross's generalization, whereas LLMs apparently don't. And this is a case of what Chomsky in 1971 called poverty of the stimulus. That is the stimulus that we, or the input that we as humans get when we acquire our mother's tongue is not perfect. It doesn't have all the examples we need. It contains errors. People say some sentences and then they get confused or they change their phrases. And as infants, we need to acquire language despite the poverty of the stimulus. Now for LLMs that learn from much more data than we are exposed to as infants, they, if they are not biased, apparently they don't learn those generalizations. So in general, when exposed to data sets similar in size to what children receive or bigger in size, LMs fail to know fundamental and systematic aspects of language. And this is a major difference between LLMs and humans. Okay, let's have another experiment. So this time it's mine, so I didn't really publish a paper, Rosenbaum 2023, uh, but I would like to share with you an example uh, that I did when playing around with ChatGPT. So let's consider this sentence. Jane hopes that Mary will mention her. What did this sentence say? Well, theoretically, we could think of two different meanings here. One is that Jane hopes that Mary will mention her her as in Jane, so both words are colored blue here. And another meaning could be Jane hopes that Mary will mention her, given Mary. So according to the first, Jane hopes that Mary will mention Jane. And according to the second, Jane hopes that Mary will mention Mary. Are these two meanings actually acceptable in English? So if you ask native speakers of English, they will tell you that the first one is perfectly valid. Jane hoped that Mary will mention her, Jane. But the second is just not there. As a speaker of English, they cannot grasp this meaning of this sentence. And if you're not a native speaker of English, you may try a translation of this sentence. This phenomenon has been tested and shown in many different languages. So chances are you'll get the same intuition. What happens to GPT? So again, I'm asking GPT-4 in this sentence, Jane hopes that Mary will mention here the same sentence as before. 
One, can Harry refer to Jane? Two, can Harry refer to Mary? And GPT says, in both cases, that yes, it can refer to Jane or it can refer to Mary. And it goes on to say, so the sentence is ambiguous without further context. The pronoun Harry could refer to either Jane or Mary. Additional context typically helps to clarify this. Well, I'm sorry, GPT, this is just wrong. And it's not wrong because of a fact that is incorrect, but because the grammar of language, presumably if we accept Chomsky's claims, the innate structure of language prevents the second meaning from being a possible meaning of this sentence. So the observation that we can make is that our knowledge as humans is just different than the knowledge that LLMs possess about language. Let's consider a different subject for a sec. So we'll play with some sentences. The man saw the dog. This is a completely fine, pretty simple sentence in English, right? Sentence two, the dog the cat saw smiled. Or we could write the dog that the cat saw smiled. So here we have a dog that the cat saw, so the cat saw the dog, and that dog, the dog that the cat saw, that dog smiled. All right, fair enough. We might think about it for a bit, but we can get it right. How about this sentence? The mouse, the cat, the dog chased bit died. Well, I don't know about you, I just feel like I have a salad of words thrown in at me. Um, or how about this? The monkey, the mouse, the cat, the dog chased, saw, beat, died. Well, that's hard. Um, could we understand those sentences if we try, like, really hard and slow with, say, some peace and quiet and a pen and paper, maybe? Well, I think we could. Let's take this slowly. So, the dog, the cat, saw, smile. This was sentence two before. Um, let's consider this one. So, we have... The cat saw, right? So we can see the cat saw the dog. So the dog that the cat saw smiled. All right, cool. By the same logic, we can see that we work from the middle and outwards. This is called center embeddings. So let's look at sentence number three from before. The mouse, the cat, the dog chased bit died. And let's work gradually. So we can say, if we look at the middle, that the dog chased, right? So we have the dog chased. Who did the dog chase? So it's the cat that the dog chased. So the cat the dog chased bit. Who did that cat? The cat that the dog chased. Who did that cat bite? The mouse. So we have the mouse that the cat that the dog chased bit, that mouse died. So it wasn't easy at all, but we managed to do it. And we managed to do it because what we know about language, our competence is different than what we call our performance. That is, we might have some constraints on working memory on how much we're able to process, but if we get pen, paper, and we get enough time, we're able to understand what this sentence is supposed to mean. So the observation is that with more time, and it could be quiet or a paper, humans perform better. Unlike where you don't sleep enough and you have a lot of noise and very limited time to reply. So this is a distinction that has been made in linguistics for a long time that at least when you talk about humans, competence, that is what we know about language, is different than performance, how well we perform in these kind of metalinguistic tasks. How about LLMs? Well, GPT-4 does really, really well. So if I get to ask in the sentence the mouse that the cat that the dog painted taught sang, what did the mouse do, what did the cat do? GPT does an incredible job and explains correctly what the mouse did and what the cat did and also explains that this is somewhat complex due to its recursive structure a clause within a clause but it can be disentangled by breaking it down and it does a really good job at it it answers 
immediately without needing to think. But well, here we can just say that fair enough, GPT has time or computation time. But if we get back to GPT 3.5, and this is an example from Ktir's paper again. So Ktir asks in the sentence, the mouse that the cat that the dog painted thought sang, what did the mouse do and what did the cat do? And GPT says the sentence is a grammatically correct sentence, but it is semantically nonsensical because it contains a syntactical ambiguity that makes it difficult to determine its meaning. Now, just to be clear, this sentence is not ambiguous syntactically. It has only one possible meaning, only one way to parse syntactically. Now, some humans could reply the same to that, right? I mean, they could be confused by the difficulty of parsing this sentence and reply with something similar to what GPT says. But then Katsir does something really nice and asks GPT try to think a bit longer and answer the questions again. So in this case, Katsir is trying to provide GPT with the equivalent of telling a human, wait, let's take this slowly, take your pen and paper, think for as long as you need, and then humans perform better. GPT on the other hand, says I apologize, but even after careful consideration, I must reiterate that the sentence is still semantically nonsensical due to the syntactical ambiguity it presents. So what we see here is that with GPT-4, it got everything right, GPT-3.5, even when it got time to think more, it failed the task. And the important thing here is that among humans, we see a very clear difference between competence and performance with regards to knowledge about language or the ability to correctly answer different linguistic tasks, whereas with large language models, it seems that competence is the same as performance. So given all the time that the LLM might need, it still performs the same. I would note that there has been some pretty nice evidence for showing that LLMs can reflect on their answers, but that's a different subject, perhaps for a different video. One last experiment. So let's play with some sentences, and again from Katir's paper. The little duck that met the horse with a blue spot yesterday. And how would you complete this sentence? So I'll give you two possible completions. One is R, so the little duck that met the horse with a blue spot yesterday, R. And of course you would continue after that. And the second option is destroys. So the little duck that met the horse with a blue spot yesterday destroys. So if we ask that, speakers of English, they say, well, of course, destroys. I mean, R cannot be attached to the sentence in a way that it would be grammatical. It can, just can't be, right? You can't attach R to any of the phrases here in a way that makes sense. Destroys is not really likely, perhaps. I mean, the little duck destroys. What does he destroy? But it is still grammatical. Now, GPT answers like so. So here's the beginning of an English sentence. The little duck that met the horses with the blue spots yesterday. Which of the following two words is a better next word and why? A, R, B, destroys. So GPT says that the better next word in this case would be A, R. And the sentence is describing a situation in which the little duck met the horses, so it makes sense to continue with a verb that maintains the context. R is a plural form of B and can be used to describe the state of the horses or characteristics they possess. In this case, it could be used to further describe the horses with the blue spots, which theoretically could be true, but not in this sentence, right? Because there is no way to combine the word R with the sentence that would make it grammatical. On the other hand, GPT notes that destroys changes the context abruptly, which is true, but still, this is the grammatical option. So a human speaker would prefer this option over the ungrammatical one. So again, what does it even teach us? So what we can see here is that LLMs lack a distinction between grammaticality, that is whether a sentence is grammatical in a language, and likelihood, whether this token or word is probable, is likely to appear next to the other tokens 
in this language. And humans have that distinction. Why do LLMs lack that distinction? Well, basically, they are statistical models. They are based on likelihoods. That's what they do. They learn to find the probability for the next word appearing, given this prefix of words that they have encountered so far. So LLMs prefer an ungrammatical but somewhat likely continuation, like R in the case we just saw, over an unlikely but perfectly grammatical continuation, like destroys. So, what observations have we made? Well, we saw that humans make generalizations that LLMs don't, like that gap generalization that we saw when we talked about sentences with the word and, like the fact that when you say Mary thought that Jane mentioned her, so her could only refer to Mary in that case and not Jane. So there are those generalizations about language that humans make and LLMs don't. We also saw that competence, what we know, is different from performance, at least among humans. So when humans see sentences such as the dog, the cat, the mouse, beat, saw, died, we're confused. We don't know what to do with them. But if we take our time, we're able to slowly dissect them and understand their meaning. Whereas large language models don't seem to have that distinction between competence and performance. We also saw that LLMs don't have the distinction between likely and grammaticality. That is, they might prefer tokens that are likely in the surrounding of the prefix they got, but would yield an ungrammatical sentence over a grammatical but not really likely continuation, which is different than what we humans do. So basically, we see that LLMs are poor models of actual human linguistic cognition. And again, it doesn't say anything against LLMs. They are amazing tools, amazing engineering tools, amazing research tools, just not amazing models of actual human cognition. We also saw that linguistics is awesome. I hope I was able to convince you with that. So some main takeaway from this talk. LLMs are wonderful engineering tools. Humans generate a lot of noise about them, saying things like the AI apocalypse is here or LLMs refute Chomsky's approach to linguistics or language. Discerning claims is a skill. You take this claim, saying something like LLMs refute Chomsky's approach to language, and you consider it carefully. You say, okay, if LLMs are models of actual human cognition, it means they should act like humans do in a variety of tasks. And then you start to scientifically test those claims. In general, be humble, be professional. I mean, don't make bold claims that are not really justified by data or experiments or a lot of experience that you have. And basically, I personally try to refrain from stating bold claims that I can't actually justify. And it's super interesting. Human cognition, AI, two really interesting topics and the intersection can obviously yield very interesting discussions. So I hope you've enjoyed this video about LLMs and whether they make good models for actual human cognition. I really hope you enjoyed it, but I'm very curious. Please tell me what your thoughts are, post any questions, comments, requests, or just anything in the comments below. Let me know if you're interested in more videos about generative AI. And in any ways, I will see you all in the next video, probably about computer networks.